An American Tragedy. Novel by Theodore Dreiser. Chapter 11. The days lapsed and, although no further word came from the Griffiths, Clyde was still inclined to exaggerate the importance of this one contact and to dream from time to time of delightful meetings with those girls and how wonderful if a love affair with one of them might eventuate for him. The beauty of that world in which they moved. The luxury and charm as opposed to this of which he was a part. Dillard. Rita. Tush. They were really dead for him. He aspired to this other or nothing as he saw it now and proceeded to prove as distant to Dillard as possible. An attitude which by degrees tended to alienate that youth entirely for he saw in Clyde a snob which potentially he was if he could have but won to what he desired. However, as he began to see afterwards, time passed and he was left to work until. Depressed by the routine, meager pay and commonplace shrinking room contacts. He began to think not so much of returning to Rita or Dillard, he could not quite think of them now with any satisfaction. But of giving up this venture here and returning to Chicago or going to New York, where he was sure that he could connect himself with some hotel if need be. But then, as if to revive his courage and confirm his earlier dreams, a thing happened which caused him to think that certainly he was beginning to rise in the estimation of the Griffiths, father and son, whether they troubled to entertain him socially or not. For it chanced that one Saturday in spring, Samuel Griffiths decided to make a complete tour of inspection of the factory with Joshua Wiggum at his elbow. Reaching the shrinking department about noon, he observed for the first time with some dismay. Clyde in his undershirt and trousers working at the feeding end of two of the shrinking racks, his nephew having by this time acquired the necessary skill to feed as well as take. And recalling how very neat and generally presentable he had appeared at his house but a few weeks before, he was decidedly disturbed by the contrast. For one thing he had felt about Clyde, both in Chicago and here at his home, was that he had presented a neat and pleasing appearance. And he, almost as much as his son, was jealous, not only of the name, but the general social appearance of the Griffiths before the employees of this factory as well as the community at large. And the sight of Clyde here, looking so much like Gilbert and in an armorless shirt and trousers working among these men, tended to impress upon him more sharply than at any time before the fact that Clyde was his nephew. And that he ought not to be compelled to continue at this very menial form of work any longer. To the other employees it might appear that he was unduly indifferent to the meaning of such a relationship. Without, however, saying a word to Wiggum or anyone else at the time, he waited until his son returned on Monday morning. From a trip that he had taken out of town, when he called him into his office and observed, I made a tour of the factory Saturday and found young Clyde still down in the shrinking room. What of it, Dad? replied his son, curiously interested as to why his father should at this time wish to mention Clyde in this special way. Other people before him have worked down there and it hasn't hurt them. All true enough, but they weren't nephews of mine. And they didn't look as much like you as he does a comment which irritated Gilbert greatly. It won't do, I tell you. It doesn't look quite right to me and I'm afraid it won't look right to other people here who see how much he looks like you and know that he is your cousin and my nephew. I didn't realize that at first, because I haven't been down there, but I don't think it wise to keep him down there any longer doing that kind of thing. It won't do. We'll have to make a change, switch him around somewhere else where he won't look like that. His eyes darkened and his brow wrinkled. The impression that Clyde made in his old clothes and with beads of sweat standing out on his forehead had not been pleasant. But I'll tell you how it is, Dad, Gilbert persisted, anxious and determined because of his innate opposition to Clyde to keep him there if possible. I'm not so sure that I can find just the right place for him now anywhere else, at least not without moving someone else who has been here a long time and worked hard to get there. He hasn't had any training in anything so far, but just what he's doing. Don't know or don't care anything about that, replied Griffiths Sr., feeling that his son was a little jealous and in consequence disposed to be unfair to Clyde. That's no place for him and I won't have him there any longer. He's been there long enough. 
and I can't afford to have the name of any of this family come to mean anything but just what it does around here now, reserve and ability and energy and good judgment. It's not good for the business, and anything less than that is a liability. You get me, don't you? Yes, I get you all right, Governor. Well, then, do as I say. Get hold of Wiggum and figure out some other place for him around here, and not as peace worker or a hand either. It was a mistake to put him down there in the first place. There must be some little place in one of the departments where he can be fitted in as the head of something, first or second or third assistant to someone. And where he can wear a decent suit of clothes and look like somebody. And, if necessary, let him go home on full pay until you find something for him. But I want him changed. By the way, how much is he being paid now? About fifteen, I think, replied Gilbert blandly. Not enough, if he's to make the right sort of an appearance here. Better make it twenty-five. It's more than he's worth. I know, but it can't be helped now. He has to have enough to live on while he's here, and from now on, I'd rather pay him that than have anyone think we were not treating him right. All right, all right, Governor. Please don't be cross about it, will you? pleaded Gilbert, noting his father's irritation. I'm not entirely to blame. You agreed to it in the first place when I suggested it, didn't you? But I guess you're right at that. Just leave it to me. I'll find a decent place for him, and turning. He proceeded in search of Wiggum, although at the same time thinking how he was to effect all this without permitting Clyde to get the notion that he was at all important here. To make him feel that this was being done as a favor to him and not for any reasons of merit in connection with himself. And at once, Wiggum appearing, he, after a very diplomatic approach on the part of Gilbert, racked his brains, scratched his head. Went away and returned after a time to say that the only thing he could think of. Since Clyde was obviously lacking in technical training, was that of assistant to Mr. Liggett, who was foreman in charge of five big stitching rooms on the fifth floor. But who had under him one small and very special, though by no means technical, department which required the separate supervision of either an assistant for lady or man. This was the stamping room, a separate chamber at the west end of the stitching floor, where were received daily from the cutting room above from seventy-five to one hundred thousand dozen unstitched collars of different brands and sizes. And here they were stamped by a group of girls according to the slips or directions attached to them with the size and brand of the collar. The sole business of the assistant foreman in charge here, as Gilbert well knew, after maintaining due decorum and order, was to see that this stamping process went uninterruptedly forward. Also that after the seventy-five to one hundred thousand dozen collars were duly stamped and transmitted to the stitchers, who were just outside in the larger room, to see that they were duly credited in a book of entry, and that the number of dozens stamped by each girl was duly recorded in order that her pay should correspond with her services. For this purpose a little desk and various entry books, according to size and brand, were kept here. Also the cutter's slips, as taken from the bundles by the stampers were eventually delivered to this assistant in lots of a dozen or more and filed on spindles. It was really nothing more than a small clerkship, at times in the past held by young men or girls or old men or middle-aged women, according to the exigencies of the life of the place. The thing that Wiggum feared in connection with Clyde and which he was quick to point out to Gilbert on this occasion was that because of his inexperience and youth Clyde might not, at first, prove as urgent and insistent a master of this department as the work there required. There were nothing but young girls there, some of them quite attractive. Also was it wise to place a young man of Clyde's years and looks among so many girls? For, being susceptible, as he might well be at that age, he might prove too easy, not stern enough. The girls might take advantage of him. If so, it wouldn't be possible to keep him there very long. Still there was this temporary vacancy, and it was the only one in the whole factory at the moment. Why not, for the time being, send him upstairs for a tryout? 
It might not be long before either Mr. Liggett or himself would know of something else or whether or not he was suited for the work up there. In that case it would be easy to make a re-transfer. Accordingly, about three in the afternoon of this same Monday, Clyde was sent for and after being made to wait for some fifteen minutes as was Gilbert's method, he was admitted to the austere presence. Well, how are you getting along down where you are now? asked Gilbert coldly and inquisitorially. And Clyde, who invariably experienced a depression whenever he came anywhere near his cousin, replied, with a poorly forced smile. Oh, just about the same, Mr. Griffiths. I can't complain. I like it well enough. I'm a learning a little something, I guess. You guess? Well, I know I've learned a few things, of course, added Clyde, flushing slightly and feeling down deep within himself a keen resentment at the same time that he achieved a half ingratiating and half apologetic smile. Well, that's a little better. A man could hardly be down there as long as you've been and not know whether he had learned anything or not. Then deciding that he was being too severe, perhaps, he modified his tone slightly, and added, but that's not why I sent for you. There's another matter I want to talk to you about. Tell me, did you ever have charge of any people or any other person than yourself, at any time in your life? I don't believe I quite understand, replied Clyde, who, because he was a little nervous and flustered, had not quite registered the question accurately. I mean have you ever had any people work under you, been given a few people to direct in some department somewhere? Been a foreman or an assistant foreman in charge of anything? No, sir, I never have, answered Clyde, but so nervous that he almost stuttered. For Gilbert's tone was very severe and cold, highly contemptuous. At the same time, now that the nature of the question was plain, its implication came to him. In spite of his cousin's severity, his ill manner toward him. Still, he could see his employers were thinking of making a foreman of him putting him in charge of somebody, people. They must be. At once his ears and fingers began to titillate, the roots of his hair to tingle, but I've seen how it's done in clubs and hotels, he added at once. And I think I might manage if I were given a trial. His cheeks were now highly colored, his eyes crystal clear. Not the same thing. Not the same thing, insisted Gilbert sharply. Seeing and doing are two entirely different things. A person without any experience can think a lot. But when it comes to doing, he's not there. Anyhow, this is one business that requires people who do know. He stared at Clyde critically and quizzically while Clyde, feeling that he must be wrong in his notion that something was going to be done for him, began to quiet himself. His cheeks resumed their normal pallor and the light died from his eyes. Yes, sir, I guess that's true, too he commented. But you don't need to guess in this case, insisted Gilbert. You know. That's the trouble with people who don't know. They're always guessing. The truth was that Gilbert was so irritated to think that he must now make a place for his cousin, and that despite his having done nothing at all to deserve it, that he could scarcely conceal the spleen that now colored his mood. You're right, I know, said Clyde placatingly for he was still hoping for this hinted at promotion. Well, the fact is, went on Gilbert, I might have placed you in the accounting end of the business when you first came if you had been technically equipped for it. The phrase technically equipped overawed and terrorized Clyde, for he scarcely understood what that meant, as it was, went on Gilbert. Nonchalantly, we had to do the best we could for you. We knew it was not very pleasant down there but we couldn't do anything more for you at the time. He drummed on his desk with his fingers. But the reason I called you up here today is this. I want to discuss with you a temporary vacancy that has occurred in one of our departments upstairs and which we are wondering, my father and I, whether you might be able to fill. Clyde's spirits rose amazingly. Both my father and I, he went on, have been thinking for some little time that we would like to do a little something for you. But as I say, your lack of practical training of any kind makes it very difficult for both of us. You haven't had either a commercial or a trade education of any kind, and that makes it doubly hard. 
he paused long enough to allow that to sink in, give Clyde the feeling that he was an interloper indeed. Still, he added after a moment. So long as we have seen fit to bring you on here, we have decided to give you a tryout at something better than you are doing. It won't do to let you stay down there indefinitely. Now, let me tell you a little something about what I have in mind, and he proceeded to explain the nature of the work on the fifth floor. And when after a time Wiggum was sent for and appeared and had acknowledged Clyde's salutation, he observed. Wiggum, I've just been telling my cousin here about our conversation this morning and what I told you about our plan to try him out as the head of that department. So if you'll just take him up to Mr. Liggett and have him or someone explain the nature of the work up there, I'll be obliged to you. He turned to his desk. After that you can send him back to me, he added. I want to talk to him again. Then he arose and dismissed them both with an air, and Wiggum. Still somewhat dubious as to the experiment, but now very anxious to be pleasant to Clyde since he could not tell what he might become, led the way to Mr. Liggett's floor and there, amid a thunderous hum of machines. Clyde was led to the extreme west of the building and into a much smaller department which was merely railed off from the greater chamber by a low fence. Here were about twenty-five girls and their assistants with baskets, who apparently were doing their best to cope with a constant stream of unstitched collar bundles which fell through several chutes from the floor above. And now at once, after being introduced to Mr. Liggett, he was escorted to a small railed-off desk at which sat a short, plump girl of about his own years, not so very attractive, who arose as they approached. This is Miss Todd, began Wigan. She's been in charge for about ten days now in the absence of Mrs. Angier. And what I want you to do now, Miss Todd, is to explain to Mr. Griffiths here just as quickly and clearly as you can what it is you do here. And then later in the day when he comes up here, I want you to help him to keep track of things until he sees just what is wanted and can do it himself. You'll do that, won't you? Why, certainly, Mr. Wiggum. I'll be only too glad to, complied Miss Todd, and at once she began to take down the books of records and to show Clyde how the entry and discharge records were kept, also later how the stamping was done. How the basket girls took the descending bundles from the chutes and distributed them evenly according to the needs of the stamper and how later. As fast as they were stamped. Other basket girls carried them to the stitchers outside. And Clyde, very much interested, felt that he could do it, only among so many women on a floor like this he felt very strange. There were so very, very many women, hundreds of them, stretching far and away between white walls and white columns to the eastern end of the building. And tall windows that reached from floor to ceiling let in a veritable flood of light. These girls were not all pretty. He saw them out of the tail of his eye as first Miss Todd and later Wiggum, and even Liggett, volunteered to impress points on him. The important thing, explained Wiggum after a time, is to see that there is no mistake as to the number of thousands of dozens of collars that come down here and are stamped. And also that there's no delay in stamping them and getting them out to the stitches. Also that the records of these girls' work is kept accurately so that there won't be any mistakes as to their time. At last Clyde saw what was required of him and the conditions under which he was about to work and said so. He was very nervous but quickly decided that if this girl could do the work, he could. And because Liggett and Wiggum, interested by his relationship to Gilbert, appeared very friendly and persisted in delaying here, saying that there was nothing he could not manage they were sure, he returned after a time with Wiggum to Gilbert who, on seeing him enter, at once observed, well, what's the answer? Yes or no? Do you think you can do it or do you think you can't? Well, I know that I can do it, replied Clyde with a great deal of courage for him, yet with the private feeling that he might not make good unless fortune favoured him some even now. There were so many things to be taken into consideration, the favour of those above as well as about him, and would they always favour him? Very good, then. Just be seated for a moment, went on Gilbert. I want to talk to you some more in connection with that work up there. It looks easy to you. Does it? No, 
I can't say that it looks exactly easy, replied Clyde, strained and a little pale, for because of his inexperience he felt the thing to be a great opportunity. One that would require all his skill and courage to maintain. Just the same I think I can do it. In fact I know I can and I'd like to try. Well, now, that sounds a little better, replied Gilbert crisply and more graciously. And now I want to tell you something more about it. I don't suppose you ever thought there was a flaw with that many women on it, did you? No, sir, I didn't, replied Clyde. I knew they were somewhere in the building, but I didn't know just where. Exactly, went on Gilbert. This plant is practically operated by women from cellar to roof. In the manufacturing department. I venture to say there are ten women to every man. On that account everyone in whom we entrust any responsibility around here must be known to us as to their moral and religious character. If you weren't related to us, and if we didn't feel that because of that we knew a little something about you. We wouldn't think of putting you up there or anywhere in this factory over anybody until we did know. But don't think because you're related to us that we won't hold you strictly to account for everything that goes on up there and for your conduct. We will, and all the more so because you are related to us. You understand that, do you? And why, the meaning of the Griffith's name here? Yes, sir, replied Clyde. Very well, then, went on Gilbert. Before we place anyone here in any position of authority, we have to be absolutely sure that they're going to behave themselves as gentlemen always, that the women who are working here are going to receive civil treatment always. If a young man, or an old one for that matter, comes in here at any time and imagines that because there are women here he's going to be allowed to play about and neglect his work and flirt or cut up, that fellow is doomed to a short stay here. The men and women who work for us have got to feel that they are employees first, last and all the time, and they have to carry that attitude out into the street with them. And unless they do it, and we hear anything about it, that man or woman is done for so far as we are concerned. We don't want them and we won't have them. And once we're through with them, we're through with them. He paused and stared at Clyde as much as to say, now I hope I have made myself clear. Also that we will never have any trouble in so far as you are concerned. And Clyde replied, yes, I understand. I think that's right. In fact I know that's the way it has to be. And ought to be, added Gilbert. And ought to be, echoed Clyde. At the same time he was wondering whether it was really true as Gilbert said. Had he not heard the mill girls already spoken about in a slighting way? Yet consciously at the moment he did not connect himself in thought with any of these girls upstairs. His present mood was that, because of his abnormal interest in girls, it would be better if he had nothing to do with them at all, never spoke to any of them, kept a very distant and cold attitude, such as Gilbert was holding toward him. It must be so, at least if he wished to keep his place here. And he was now determined to keep it and to conduct himself always as his cousin wished. Well, now, then, went on Gilbert as if to supplement Clyde's thoughts in this respect, what I want to know of you is, if I trouble to put you in that department, even temporarily. Can I trust you to keep a level head on your shoulders and go about your work conscientiously and not have your head turned or disturbed by the fact that you're working among a lot of women and girls? Yes, sir, I know you can, replied Clyde very much impressed by his cousin's succinct demand, although, after Rita, a little dubious. If I can't, now is the time to say so, persisted Gilbert. By blood you're a member of this family. And to our help here, and especially in a position of this kind, you represent us. We can't have anything come up in connection with you at any time around here that won't be just right. So I want you to be on your guard and watch your step from now on. Not the least thing must occur in connection with you that anyone can comment on unfavorably. You understand, do you? Yes, sir, replied Clyde most solemnly. I understand that. I'll conduct myself properly or I'll get out. And he was thinking seriously at the moment that he could and would. The large number of girls and women upstairs seemed very remote and of no consequence just then. Very good. 
Now, I'll tell you what else I want you to do. I want you to knock off for the day and go home and sleep on this and think it over well. Then come back in the morning and go to work up there, if you still feel the same. Your salary from now on will be $25. And I want you to dress neat and clean so that you will be an example to the other men who have charge of departments. He arose coldly and distantly, but Clyde, very much encouraged and enthused by the sudden jump in salary, as well as the admonition in regard to dressing well, felt so grateful toward his cousin that he longed to be friendly with him. To be sure, he was hard and cold and vain, but still he must think something of him, and his uncle too, or they would not choose to do all this for him and so speedily. And if ever he were able to make friends with him, win his way into his good graces, think how prosperously he would be placed here, what commercial and social honors might not come to him. So elated was he at the moment that he bustled out of the great plant with a jaunty stride, resolved among other things that from now on, come what might, and as a test of himself in regard to life and work, he was going to be all that his uncle and cousin obviously expected of him, cool, cold even, and if necessary severe, where these women or girls of this department were concerned. No more relations with Dillard or Rita or anybody like that for the present anyhow. End of the chapter. Now. Chapter 12. The import of $25 a week. Of being the head of a department employing 25 girls. Of wearing a good suit of clothes again. Sitting at an official desk in a corner commanding a charming river view and feeling that at last, after almost two months in that menial department below stairs, he was a figure of some consequence in this enormous institution. And because of his relationship and new dignity. Wiggum, as well as Liggett, hovering about with advice and genial and helpful comments from time to time. And some of the managers of the other departments including several from the front office, an auditor and an advertising man occasionally pausing in passing to say hello. And the details of the work sufficiently mastered to permit him to look about him from time to time, taking an interest in the factory as a whole, its processes and supplies. Such as where the great volume of linen and cotton came from, how it was cut in an enormous cutting room above this one, holding hundreds of experienced cutters receiving very high wages. How there was an employment bureau for recruiting help, a company doctor, a company hospital, a special dining room in the main building. Where the officials of the company were allowed to dine, but no others, and that he, being an accredited department head could now lunch with those others in that special restaurant if he chose and could afford to. Also he soon learned that several miles out from Lycurgus, on the Mohawk, near a hamlet called Vantrope, was an interfactory country club, to which most of the department heads of the various factories about belonged, but, alas, as he also learned. Griffiths and company did not really favor their officials mixing with those of any other company, and for that reason few of them did. Yet he, being a member of the family, as Liggett once said to him, could probably do as he chose as to that. But he decided, because of the strong warnings of Gilbert, as well as his high blood relations with his family, that he had better remain as aloof as possible. And so smiling and being as genial as possible to all, nevertheless for the most part, and in order to avoid Dillard and others of his ilk, and although he was much more lonely than otherwise he would have been. Returning to his room or the public squares of this and nearby cities on Saturday and Sunday afternoons, and even, since he thought this might please his uncle and cousin and so raise him in their esteem. Beginning to attend one of the principal Presbyterian churches, the Second or High Street Church, to which on occasion, as he had already learned. The Griffiths themselves were accustomed to resort. Yet without ever coming in contact with them in person, since from June to September they spent their weekends at Greenwood Lake, to which most of the society life of this region as yet resorted. In fact the summer life of Lycurgus, in so far as its society was concerned, was very dull. Nothing in particular ever eventuated then in the city, although previous to this, in May. There had been various affairs in connection with the Griffiths and their friends which Clyde had either read about or saw at a distance, a graduation reception and dance at the Snedeker School. 
a lawn fate upon the Griffiths grounds, with a striped marquee tent on one part of the lawn and Chinese lanterns hung in among the trees. Clyde had observed this quite by accident one evening as he was walking alone about the city. It raised many a curious and eager thoughts in regard to this family. Its high station and his relation to it. But having placed him comfortably in a small official position which was not arduous, the Griffiths now proceeded to dismiss him from their minds. He was doing well enough, and they would see something more of him later, perhaps. And then a little later he read in the Lycurgus Star that there was to be staged on June 20th the annual Intercity Automobile Floral Parade and Contest. Fonda, Gloversville, Amsterdam and Schenectady, which this year was to be held in Lycurgus and which was the last local social affair of any consequence, as the star phrased it. Before the annual Hajira to the lakes and mountains of those who were able to depart for such places. And the names of Bella, Bertine, and Sondra. To say nothing of Gilbert, were mentioned as contestants or defendants of the fair name of Lycurgus. And since this occurred on a Saturday afternoon, Clyde, dressed in his best, yet decidedly wishing to obscure himself as an ordinary spectator, was able to see once more the girl who had so infatuated him on sight, obviously breasting a white rose surfaced stream and guiding her craft with a paddle covered with yellow daffodils. A floral representation of some Indian legend in connection with the Mohawk River. With her dark hair filleted Indian fashion with a yellow feather and brown-eyed Susans. She was arresting enough not only to capture a prize, but to recapture Clyde's fancy. How marvellous to be of that world! In the same parade he had seen Gilbert Griffiths accompanied by a very attractive girl chauffeuring one of four floats representing the Four Seasons. And while the one he drove was winter, with this local society girl posed in ermine with white roses for snow all about, directly behind came another float which presented Bella Griffiths as spring, swathed in filmy draperies and crouching beside a waterfall of dark violets. The effect was quite striking and threw Clyde into a mood in regard to love, youth and romance which was delicious and yet very painful to him. Perhaps he should have retained Rita, after all. In the meantime he was living on as before, only more spaciously in so far as his own thoughts were concerned for his first thought after receiving this larger allowance was that he had better leave Mrs. Cuppies and secure a better room in some private home which, if less advantageously situated for him, would be in a better street. It took him out of all contact with Dillard. And now, since his uncle had promoted him, some representative of his or Gilbert's might wish to stop by to see him about something. And what would one such think if he found him living in a small room such as he now occupied? Ten days after his salary was raised, therefore, and because of the import of his name, he found it possible to obtain a room in one of the better houses and streets, Jefferson Avenue, which paralleled Waikiki Avenue, only a few blocks farther out. It was the home of a widow whose husband had been a mill manager and who let out two rooms without board in order to be able to maintain this home, which was above the average for one of such position in Lycurgus. And Mrs. Payton, having long been a resident of the city and knowing much about the Griffiths, recognized not only the name but the resemblance of Clyde to Gilbert. And being intensely interested by this, as well as his general appearance, she at once offered him an exceptional room for so little as five dollars a week, which he took at once. In connection with his work at the factory, however, and in spite of the fact that he had made such drastic resolutions in regard to the help who were beneath him. Still it was not always possible for him to keep his mind on the mere mechanical routine of the work or off of this company of girls as girls, since at least a few of them were attractive. For it was summer, late June and over all the factory, especially around two, three and four in the afternoon, when the endless repetition of the work seemed to pall on all. A practical indifference not remote from languor and in some instances sensuality, seemed to creep over the place. There were so many women and girls of so many different types and moods. And here they were so remote from men or idle pleasure in any form. All alone with just him, really. Again the air within the place was nearly always heavy and physically relaxing. 
and through the many open windows that reached from floor to ceiling could be seen the mohawk swirling and rippling, its banks carpeted with green grass and in places shaded by trees. Always it seemed to hint of pleasures which might be found by idling along its shores. And since these workers were employed so mechanically as to leave their minds free to roam from one thought of pleasure to another, they were for the most part thinking of themselves always and what they would do, assuming that they were not here chained to this routine. And because their moods were so brisk and passionate, they were often prone to fix on the nearest object. And since Clyde was almost always the only male present, and in these days in his best clothes, they were inclined to fix on him. They were, indeed, full of all sorts of fantastic notions in regard to his private relations with the Griffiths and their like. Where he lived and how, whom in the way of a girl he might be interested in. And he, in turn, when not too constrained by the memory of what Gilbert Griffiths had said to him, was inclined to think of them, certain girls in particular, with thoughts that bordered on the sensual. For, in spite of the wishes of the Griffiths company, and the discarded Rita or perhaps because of her, he found himself becoming interested in three different girls here. They were of a pagan and pleasure-loving turn, this trio, and they thought Clyde very handsome. Ruse Nikofoich, a Russian-American girl, big and blonde and animal, with swimming brown eyes, a snub fat nose and chin, was very much drawn to him. Only, such was the manner with which he carried himself always, that she scarcely dared to let herself think so. For to her, with his hair so smoothly parted, torsoed in a bright striped shirt, the sleeves of which in this weather were rolled to the elbows, he seemed almost too perfect to be real. She admired his clean, brown polished shoes, his brightly buckled black leather belt, and the loose four-in-hand tie he wore. Again there was Martha Bordler, a stocky, brisk Canadian French girl of trim, if rotund. Figure and ankles, hair of a reddish gold and eyes of greenish blue with puffy pink cheeks and hands that were plump and yet small. Ignorant and pagan, she saw in Clyde someone whom, even for so much as an hour, assuming that he would, she would welcome, and that most eagerly. At the same time, being feline and savage. She hated all or any who even so much as presumed to attempt to interest him, and despised Rusa for that reason. For as she could see Rusa tried to nudge or lean against Clyde whenever he came sufficiently near. At the same time she herself sought by every single device known to her, her shirt waist left open to below the borders of her white breast, her outer skirt lifted trimly above her calves when working. Her plump round arms displayed to the shoulders to show him that physically at least she was worth his time, and the sly eyes and languorous looks when he was near. Which caused Rosa to exclaim one day, that French cat. He should look at her. And because of Clyde she had an intense desire to strike her. And yet again there was the stocky and yet gay Flora Brandt, a decidedly low-class American type of coarse and yet enticing features, black hair, large. Swimming and heavily lashed black eyes, a snub nose and full and sensuous and yet pretty lips, and a vigorous and not ungraceful body. Who, from day to day, once he had been there a little while, had continued to look at him as if to say, What? You don't think I'm attractive? And with a look which said, How can you continue to ignore me? There are lots of fellows who would be delighted to have your chance, I can tell you. And, in connection with these three, the thought came to him after a time that since they were so different, more common as he thought. Less well guarded and less sharply interested in the conventional aspects of their contacts. It might be possible and that without detection on the part of anyone for him to play with one or another of them, or all three in turn if his interest should eventually carry him so far, without being found out particularly if beforehand he chose to impress on them the fact that he was condescending when he noticed them at all. Most certainly, if he could judge by their actions, they would willingly reward him by letting him have his way with them somewhere. And think nothing of it afterward if he chose to ignore them, as he must to keep his position here. Nevertheless, having given his word as he had to Gilbert Griffiths, he was still in no mood to break it. These were merely thoughts which from time to time were aroused in him by a situation which for him was difficult in the extreme.
His was a disposition easily and often intensely inflamed by the chemistry of sex and the formula of beauty. He could not easily withstand the appeal, let alone the call, of sex. And by the actions and approaches of each in turn he was surely tempted at times, especially in these warm and languorous summer days, with no place to go and no single intimate to commune with. From time to time he could not resist drawing near to these very girls who were most bent on tempting him, although in the face of their looks and nudges. Not very successfully concealed at times, he maintained an aloofness and an assumed indifference which was quite remarkable for him. But just about this time there was a rush of orders, which necessitated, as both Wigham and Liggett advised. Clyde taking on a few extra tryout girls who were willing to work for the very little they could earn at the current piece work rate until they had mastered the technique, when of course they would be able to earn more. There were many such who applied at the employment branch of the main office on the ground floor. In slack times all applications were rejected or the sign hung up no help wanted. And since Clyde was relatively new to this work, and thus far had neither hired nor discharged anyone, it was agreed between Wiggum and Liggett that all the help thus sent up should first be examined by Liggett, who was looking for extra stitches also. And in case any were found who promised to be satisfactory as stampers, they were to be turned over to Clyde with the suggestion that he try them. Only before bringing anyone back to Clyde, Liggett was very careful to explain that in connection with this temporary hiring and discharging there was a system. One must not ever give a new employee, however well they did, the feeling that they were doing anything but moderately well until their capacity had been thoroughly tested. It interfered with their proper development as peace workers, the greatest results that could be obtained by any one person. Also one might freely take on as many girls as were needed to meet any such situation, and then, once the rush was over, as freely drop them, unless, occasionally. A very speedy worker was found among the novices. In that case it was always advisable to try to retain such a person, either by displacing a less satisfactory person or transferring someone from some other department. To make room for new blood and new energy. The next day, after this notice of a rush, back came four girls at different times and escorted always by Liggett, who in each instance explained to Clyde. He is a girl who might do for you. Miss Tyndall is her name. You might give her a tryout. Or, you might see if this girl will be of any use to you. And Clyde, after he had questioned them as to where they had worked, what the nature of the general working experiences were, and whether they lived at home here in Lycurgus or alone, the bachelor girl was not much wanted by the factory, would explain the nature of the work and pay. And then call Miss Todd, who in her turn would first take them to the restroom where were lockers for their coats, and then to one of the tables where they would be shown what the process was. And later it was Miss Todd's and Clyde's business to discover how well they were getting on and whether it was worthwhile to retain them or not. Up to this time, apart from the girls to whom he was so definitely drawn, Clyde was not so very favorably impressed with the type of girl who was working here. For the most part, as he saw them, they were of a heavy and rather unintelligent company. And he had been thinking that smarter looking girls might possibly be secured. Why not? Were there none in Lycurgus in the factory world? So many of these had fat hands, broad faces, heavy legs and ankles. Some of them even spoke with an accent, being Poles or the children of Poles, living in that slum north of the mill. And they were all concerned with catching a fella, going to some dancing place with him afterwards, and little more. Also, Clyde had noticed that the American types who were here were of a decidedly different texture, thinner, more nervous and for the most part more angular. And with a general reserve due to prejudices, racial, moral and religious, which would not permit them to mingle with these others or with any men, apparently. But among the extras or tryouts that were brought to him during this and several succeeding days, finally came one who interested Clyde more than any girl whom he had seen here so far. She was, as he decided on sight, more intelligent and pleasing, more spiritual, though apparently not less vigorous, if more gracefully proportioned. As a matter of fact, as he saw her at first, 
She appeared to him to possess a charm which no one else in this room had, a certain wistfulness and wonder combined with a kind of self-reliant courage and determination which marked her at once as one possessed of will and conviction to a degree. Nevertheless, as she said, she was inexperienced in this kind of work, and highly uncertain as to whether she would prove of service here or anywhere. Her name was Roberta Alden, and, as she at once explained, previous to this she had been working in a small hosiery factory in a town called Trippett's Mills 50 miles north of Lycurgus. She had on a small brown hat that did not look any too new and was pulled low over a face that was small and regular and pretty and that was haloed by bright, light brown hair. Her eyes were of a translucent grey-blue. Her little suit was commonplace, and her shoes were not so very new-looking and quite solidly sold. She looked practical and serious and yet so bright and clean and willing and possessed of so much hope and vigour that along with Liggett, who had first talked with her, he was at once taken with her. Distinctly she was above the average of the girls in this room. And he could not help wondering about her as he talked to her, for she seemed so tense, a little troubled as to the outcome of this interview, as though this was a very great adventure for her. She explained that up to this time she had been living with her parents near a town called Biltz, but was now living with friends here. She talked so honestly and simply that Clyde was very much moved by her, and for this reason wished to help her. At the same time he wondered if she were not really above the type of work she was seeking. Her eyes were so round and blue and intelligent, her lips and nose and ears and hands so small and pleasing. You're going to live in Lycurgus, then, if you can get work here? He said, more to be talking to her than anything else. Yes, she said, looking at him most directly and frankly. And the name again? He took down the record pad. Roberto Alden. And your address here? 228 Taylor Street. I don't even know where that is myself, he informed her because he liked talking to her. I haven't been here so very long, you see. He wondered just why afterwards he had chosen to tell her as much about himself so swiftly. Then he added, I don't know whether Mr. Liggett has told you all about the work here. But it's piecework you know, stamping collars. I'll show you if you'll just step over here, and he led the way to a nearby table where the stampers were. After letting her observe how it was done, and without calling Miss Todd, he picked up one of the collars and proceeded to explain all that had been previously explained to him. At the same time, because of the intentness with which she observed him and his gestures, the seriousness with which she appeared to take all that he said, he felt a little nervous and embarrassed. There was something quite searching and penetrating about her glance. After he had explained once more what the bundle rate was, and how much some made and how little others, and she had agreed that she would like to try. He called Miss Todd, who took her to the locker room to hang up her hat and coat. Then presently he saw her returning. A fluff of light hair about her forehead, her cheeks slightly flushed, her eyes very intent and serious. And as advised by Miss Todd. He saw her turn back her sleeves, revealing a pretty pair of forearms. Then she fell to, and by her gestures Clyde guessed that she would prove both speedy and accurate. For she seemed most anxious to obtain and keep this place. After she had worked a little while, he went to her side and watched her as she picked up and stamped the collars piled beside her and threw them to one side. Also the speed and accuracy with which she did it. Then, because for a second she turned and looked at him, giving him an innocent and yet cheerful and courageous smile, he smiled back, most pleased. Well, I guess you'll make out all right, he ventured to say, since he could not help feeling that she would and instantly, for a second only, she turned and smiled again. And Clyde, in spite of himself, was quite thrilled. He liked her on the instant, but because of his own station here, of course, as he now decided, as well as his promise to Gilbert. He must be careful about being congenial with any of the help in this room, even as charming a girl as this. It would not do. He had been guarding himself in connection with the others and must with her too a thing which seemed a little strange to him then. For he was very much drawn to her. She was so pretty and cute. 
yet she was a working girl, as he remembered now, too, a factory girl, as Gilbert would say, and he was her superior. But she was so pretty and cute. Instantly he went on to others who had been put on this same day, and finally coming to Miss Todd asked her to report pretty soon on how Miss Alden was getting along, that he wanted to know. But at the same time that he had addressed Roberta. And she had smiled back at him, Ruse Nikofoich, who was working two tables away, nudged the girl working next her, and without anyone noting it, first winked. Then indicated with a slight movement of the head both Clyde and Roberta. Her friend was to watch them. And after Clyde had gone away and Roberta was working as before, she leaned over and whispered. He says she'll do already. Then she lifted her eyebrows and compressed her lips. And her friend replied, so softly that no one could hear her, pretty quick, eh? And he didn't seem to see anyone else at all before. Then the twain smiled most wisely, a choice bit between them. Ruse Nikofoich was jealous. End of the chapter. Now. Chapter 13. The reasons why a girl of Roberta's type should be seeking employment with Griffiths and company at this time and in this capacity are of some point. For, somewhat after the fashion of Clyde in relation to his family and his life, she too considered her life a great disappointment. She was the daughter of Titus Alden. A farmer, of near Bilts, a small town in Mimica County, some fifty miles north. And from her youth up she had seen little but poverty. Her father, the youngest of three sons of Ephraim Alden. A farmer in this region before him, was so unsuccessful that at forty-eight he was still living in a house which, though old and much in need of repair at the time his father willed it to him, was now bordering upon a state of dilapidation. The house itself, while primarily a charming example of that excellent taste which produced those delightful gabled homes which embellish the average New England town and street, had been by now so reduced for want of paint, shingles, and certain flags which had once made a winding walk from a road gate to the front door, that it presented a decidedly melancholy aspect to the world, as though it might be coughing and saying, well, things are none too satisfactory with me. The interior of the house corresponded with the exterior. The floorboards and stairboards were loose and creaked most eerily at times. Some of the windows had shades, some did not. Furniture of both an earlier and a later date. But all in a somewhat decayed condition, intermingled and furnished it in some nondescript manner which need hardly be described. As for the parents of Roberta, they were excellent examples of that native type of Americanism which resists facts and reveres illusion. Titus Salden was one of that vast company of individuals who are born, pass through and die out of the world without ever quite getting any one thing straight. They appear, blunder, and end in a fog. Like his two brothers, both older and almost as nebulous, Titus was a farmer solely because his father had been a farmer. And he was here on this farm because it had been willed to him and because it was easier to stay here and try to work this than it was to go elsewhere. He was a Republican because his father before him was a Republican and because this county was Republican. It never occurred to him to be otherwise. And, as in the case of his politics and his religion, he had borrowed all his notions of what was right and wrong from those about him. A single, serious, intelligent or rightly informing book had never been read by any member of this family, not one. But they were nevertheless excellent. As conventions, morals and religions go, honest, upright, God-fearing and respectable. In so far as the daughter of these parents was concerned, and in the face of natural gifts which fitted her for something better than this world from which she derived, she was still, in part, at least, a reflection of the religious and moral notions there and then prevailing, the views of the local ministers and the laity in general. At the same time, because of a warm, imaginative, sensuous temperament, she was filled, once she reached fifteen and sixteen. With the world old dream of all of Eve's daughters from the homeliest to the fairest, that her beauty or charm might some day and ere long smite bewitchingly and so irresistibly the soul of a given man nor men. So it was that although throughout her infancy and girlhood she was compelled to hear of and share a depriving and toilsome poverty, 
Still, because of her innate imagination, she was always thinking of something better. Maybe, someday, who knew, a larger city like Albany or Utica. A newer and greater life. And then what dreams? And in the orchard of a spring day later, between her fourteenth and eighteenth years when the early May sun was making pink lamps of every aged tree and the ground was pinkly carpeted with the falling and odorous petals, she would stand and breathe and sometimes laugh. Or even sigh, her arms upreached or thrown wide to life. To be alive. To have youth and the world before one. To think of the eyes and the smile of some youth of the region who by the merest chance had passed her and looked, and who might never look again, but who, nevertheless, in so doing, had stirred her young soul to dreams. Nonetheless she was shy, and hence recessive, afraid of men, especially the more ordinary types common to this region. And these in turn, repulsed by her shyness and refinement, tended to recede from her, for all of her physical charm which was too delicate for this region. Nevertheless, at the age of sixteen, having repaired to Bilt's, in order to work in Appleman's dry goods store for five dollars a week, she saw many young men who attracted her. But here because of her mood in regard to her family's position, as well as the fact that to her inexperienced eyes they appeared so much better placed than herself, she was convinced that they would not be interested in her. And here again it was her own mood that succeeded in alienating them almost completely. Nevertheless she remained working for Mr. Appleman until she was between eighteen and nineteen. All the while sensing that she was really doing nothing for herself because she was too closely identified with her home and her family, who appeared to need her. And then about this time, an almost revolutionary thing for this part of the world occurred for because of the cheapness of labor in such an extremely rural section. A small hosiery plant was built at Trippett's Mills, and though Roberta, because of the views and standards that prevailed here about, had somehow conceived of this type of work as beneath her, still she was fascinated by the reports of the high wages to be paid. Accordingly she repaired to Trippett's Mills, where, boarding at the house of a neighbor who had previously lived in Bilt's, and returning home every Saturday afternoon. She planned to bring together the means for some further form of practical education, a course at a business college at home or all like Urgus or somewhere which might fit her for something better, bookkeeping or stenography. And in connection with this dream and this attempted saving two years went by. And in the meanwhile, although she earned more money, eventually twelve dollars a week. Still, because various members of her family required so many little things and she desired to alleviate to a degree the privations of these others from which she suffered. Nearly all that she earned went to them. And again here, as at Bilt's, most of the youths of the town who were better suited to her intellectually and temperamentally, still looked upon the mere factory type as beneath them in many ways. And although Roberta was far from being that type, Still having associated herself with them she was inclined to absorb some of their psychology in regard to themselves. Indeed by then she was fairly well satisfied that no one of these here in whom she was interested would be interested in her, at least not with any legitimate intentions. And then two things occurred which caused her to think, not only seriously of marriage, but of her own future, whether she married or not. For her sister, Agnes, now twenty, and three years her junior, having recently re-encountered a young schoolmaster who some time before had conducted the district school near the Alden farm. And finding him more to her taste now than when she had been in school. Had decided to marry him. And this meant, as Roberta saw it, that she was about to take on the appearance of a spinster unless she married soon. Yet she did not quite see what was to be done until the hosiery factory at Trippett's Mills suddenly closed never to reopen. And then, in order to assist her mother, as well as help with her sister's wedding, she returned to Bilt's. But then there came a third thing which decidedly affected her dreams and plans. Grace Ma, a girl whom she had met at Trippett's Mills. 
had gone to Lycurgus and after a few weeks there had managed to connect herself with the Finchley Vacuum Cleaner Company at a salary of $15 a week and at once wrote to Roberta telling her of the opportunities that were then present in Lycurgus. For in passing the Griffiths Company, which she did daily, she had seen a large sign posted over the East Employment Door reading Girls Wanted. And inquiry revealed the fact that girls at this company were always started at nine or ten dollars, quickly taught someone of the various phases of peace work and then, once they were proficient, were frequently able to earn as much as from fourteen to sixteen dollars. According to their skill, and since board and room were only consuming seven of what she earned, she was delighted to communicate to Roberta, whom she liked very much that she might come and room with her if she wished. Roberta, having reached the place where she felt that she could no longer endure farm life but must act for herself once more, finally arranged with her mother to leave in order that she might help her more directly with her wages. But once in Lycurgus and employed by Clyde, her life, after the first flush of self-interest which a change so great implied for her, was not so much more enlarged socially or materially either, for that matter, over what it had been in Bilts and Trippett's mills. For, despite the genial intimacy of Grace Ma, a girl not nearly as attractive as Roberta, and who, because of Roberta's charm and for the most part affected gaiety, counted on her to provide a cheer and companionship which otherwise she would have lacked. Still the world into which she was inducted here was scarcely any more liberal or diversified than that from which she sprang. For, to begin with, the Newtons, sister and brother-in-law of Grace Ma, with whom she lived, and who, despite the fact that they were not unkindly, proved to be, almost more so than were the types with whom, either in Bilts or Trippett's mills, she had been in constant contact. The most ordinary small-town mill workers, religious and narrow to a degree, George Newton, as everyone could see and feel was a pleasant if not very emotional or romantic person who took his various small plans in regard to himself and his future as of the utmost importance. Primarily he was saving what little cash he could out of the wages he earned as Threadman in the Cranston Visk via factory to enable him to embark upon some business for which he thought himself fitted. And to this end, and to further enhance his meagre savings, he had joined with his wife in the scheme of taking over an old house in Taylor Street which permitted the renting of enough rooms to carry the rent and in addition to supply the food for the family and five boarders, counting their labor and worries in the process as nothing. And on the other hand, Grace Ma, as well as Newton's wife, Mary, were of that type that here as elsewhere find the bulk of their social satisfaction in such small matters as relate to the organization of a small home. The establishing of its import and integrity in a petty and highly conventional neighborhood and the contemplation of life and conduct through the lens furnished by a purely sectarian creed. And so, once part and parcel of this particular household, Roberta found after a time, that it, if not like Kyrgyz, was narrow and restricted, not wholly unlike the various narrow and restricted homes at Bilts. And these lines, according to the Newtons and their like, to be strictly observed. No good could come of breaking them. If you were a factory employee you should accommodate yourself to the world and customs of the better sort of Christian factory employees. Every day therefore, and that not so very long after she had arrived, she found herself up and making the best of a not very satisfactory breakfast in the Newton dining room. Which was usually shared by Grace and two other girls of nearly their own age, Opal Phyllis and Olive Pope, who were connected with the Cranston Visk via company. Also by a young electrician by the name of Fred Sherlock, who worked for the city lighting plant. And immediately after breakfast joining a long procession that day after day at this hour made for the mills across the river. For just outside her own door she invariably met with a company of factory girls and women, boys and men, of the same relative ages. To say nothing of many old and weary looking women who looked more like wraiths than human beings, who had issued from the various streets and houses of this vicinity. And as the crowd, because of the general inpour into it from various streets, thickened at Central Avenue, there was much ogling of the prettier girls by a certain type of factory man. 
who, not knowing any of them, still sought, as Roberta saw it, unlicensed contacts and even worse. Yet there was much giggling and simpering on the part of girls of a certain type who were by no means as severe as most of those she had known elsewhere. Shocking. And at night the same throng, reforming at the mills. Crossing the bridge at the depot and returning as it had come. And Roberta, because of her social and moral training and mood, and in spite of her decided looks and charm and strong desires, feeling alone and neglected. Oh, how sad to see the world so gay and she so lonely. And it was always after six when she reached home. And after dinner there was really nothing much of anything to do unless she and Grace attended one or another of the moving picture theatres or she could bring herself to consent to join the Newtons and Grace at a meeting of the Methodist Church. Nonetheless once part and parcel of this household and working for Clyde she was delighted with the change. This big city. This fine central avenue with its stores and moving picture theatres. These great mills. And again this Mr. Griffiths, so young, attractive, smiling and interested in her. End of the chapter. Now. Chapter 14. In the same way Clyde, on encountering her, was greatly stirred. Since the abortive contact with Dillard, Rita, and Zella, and afterwards the seemingly meaningless invitation to the Griffiths with its introduction to and yet only passing glimpse of such personages as Bella, Sondra Finchley, and Bertine Cranston, he was lonely indeed. That high world. But plainly he was not to be allowed to share in it. And yet because of his vain hope in connection with it, he had chosen to cut himself off in this way. And to what end? Was he not if anything more lonely than ever? Mrs. Peyton. Going to and from his work but merely nodding to people or talking casually, or however sociably with one or another of the storekeepers along Central Avenue who chose to hail him, or even some of the factory girls here in whom he was not interested or with whom he did not dare to develop a friendship. What was that? Just nothing really. And yet as an offset to all this, of course, was he not a Griffiths and so entitled to their respect and reverence even on this account? What a situation really! What to do! And at the same time, this Roberta Alden. Once she was placed here in this fashion and becoming more familiar with local conditions, as well as the standing of Clyde. His charm, his evasive and yet sensible interest in her, was becoming troubled as to her state too. For once part and parcel of this local home she had joined she was becoming conscious of various local taboos and restrictions which made it seem likely that never at any time here would it be possible to express an interest in Clyde or anyone above her officially. For there was a local taboo in regard to factory girls aspiring toward or allowing themselves to become interested in their official superiors. Religious, moral and reserved girls didn't do it. And again. As she soon discovered, the line of demarcation and stratification between the rich and the poor in Lycurgus was as sharp as though cut by an knife or divided by a high wall. And another taboo in regard to all the foreign family girls and men. Ignorant, low, immoral, un-American. One should, above all, have nothing to do with them. But among these people as she could see, the religious and moral, lower middle class group to which she and all of her intimates belonged, dancing or local adventurous gaiety. Such as walking the streets or going to a moving picture theatre, was also taboo. And yet she, herself, at this time, was becoming interested in dancing. Worse than this, the various young men and girls of the particular church which she and Grace Marr attended at first, were not inclined to see Roberta or Grace as equals. Since they, for the most part, were members of older and more successful families of the town. And so it was that after a very few weeks of attendance of church affairs and services, they were about where they had been when they started, conventional and acceptable, but without the amount of entertainment and diversion which was normally reaching those who were of their same church but better placed. And so it was that Roberta, after encountering Clyde and sensing the superior world in which she imagined he moved, and being so taken with the charm of his personality, was seized with the very virus of ambition and unrest that afflicted him. 
and every day that she went to the factory now she could not help but feel that his eyes were upon her in a quiet, seeking and yet doubtful way. Yet she also felt that he was too uncertain as to what she would think of any overture that he might make in her direction to risk a repulse or any offensive interpretation on her part. And yet at times, after the first two weeks of her stay here, she wishing that he would speak to her, that he would make some beginning, at other times that he must not dare, that it would be dreadful and impossible. The other girls there would see at once. And since they all plainly felt that he was too good or too remote for them, they would at once note that he was making an exception in her case and would put their own interpretation on it. And she knew the type of a girl who worked in the Griffiths stamping room would put but one interpretation on it, that of looseness. At the same time in so far as Clyde and his leaning toward her was concerned there was that rule laid down by Gilbert. And although, because of it, he had hitherto appeared not to notice or to give any more attention to one girl than another, still, once Roberta arrived, he was almost unconsciously inclined to drift by her table and pause in her vicinity to see how she was progressing. And, as he saw from the first, she was a quick and intelligent worker, soon mastering without much advice of any kind all the tricks of the work. And thereafter earning about as much as any of the others, fifteen dollars a week. And her manner was always that of one who enjoyed it and was happy to have the privilege of working here and pleased to have him pay any little attention to her. At the same time he noted to his surprise and especially since to him she seemed so refined and different, a certain exuberance and gaiety that was not only emotional, but in a delicate poetic way, sensual. Also that despite her difference and reserve she was able to make friends with and seemed to be able to understand the viewpoint of most of the foreign girls who were essentially so different from her. For, listening to her discuss the work here. First with Lena Schlicht, Hoda Patkonis, Angelina Pitti and some others who soon chose to speak to her. He reached the conclusion that she was not nearly so conventional or standoffish as most of the other American girls. And yet she did not appear to lose their respect either. Thus, one noontime, coming back from the office lunch downstairs a little earlier than usual. He found her and several of the foreign family girls, as well as four of the American girls, surrounding Polish Mary, one of the gayest and roughest of the foreign family girls, who was explaining in rather a high key how a certain fellow whom she had met the night before had given her a beaded bag, and for what purpose. I should go with him to be his sweetheart, she announced with a flourish, the while she waved the bag before the interested group. And I say, I tack him and think on him. Pretty nice bag, eh? She added, holding it aloft and turning it about. Tell me, she added with provoking and yet probably only mock serious eyes and waving the bag toward Roberta. What shall I do with him? Keep him and go with him to be his sweetheart or give him back? I like him pretty much, that bag, you bet. And although, according to the laws of her upbringing, as Clyde suspected, Roberta should have been shocked by all this. She was not, as he noticed, far from it, if one might have judged from her face. She was very much amused. Instantly she replied with a gay smile, Well, it all depends on how handsome he is, Mary. If he's very attractive, I think I'd string him along for a while, anyhow, and keep the bag as long as I could. Oh, but he no wait declared Mary archly. And with plainly a keen sense of the riskiness of the situation, the while she winked at Clyde who had drawn near. I got to give him bag or be sweetheart tonight, and so swell bag I never can buy myself. She eyed the bag archly and roguishly. Her own nose crinkling with the humor of the situation. What I do then? Gee, this is pretty strong stuff for a little country girl like Miss Alden. She won't like this, maybe, thought Clyde to himself. However, Roberta, as he now saw, appeared to be equal to the situation, for she pretended to be troubled. Gee, you are in a fix, she commented. I don't know what you'll do now. She opened her eyes wide and pretended to be greatly concerned. However, as Clyde could see, she was merely acting. But carrying it off very well. 
and frizzled hair Dutch Lena now leaned over to say, I take it and him too, you bet, if you don't want him. Where is he? I got no fella now. She reached over as if to take the bag from Mary, who as quickly withdrew it. And there were squeals of delight from nearly all the girls in the room, who were amused by this eccentric horseplay. Even Roberta laughed loudly, a fact which Clyde noted with pleasure, for he liked all this rough humor, considering it mere innocent play. Well, maybe you're right, Lena, he heard her add just as the whistle blew and the hundreds of sewing machines in the next room began to hum. A good man isn't to be found every day. Her blue eyes were twinkling and her lips, which were most temptingly modeled, were parted in a broad smile. There was much banter and more bluff in what she said than anything else. As Clyde could see, but he felt that she was not nearly as narrow as he had feared. She was human and gay and tolerant and good-natured. There was decidedly a very liberal measure of play in her. And in spite of the fact that her clothes were poor, the same little round brown hat and blue cloth dress that she had worn on first coming to work here. She was prettier than anyone else. And she never needed to paint her lips and cheeks like the foreign girls, whose faces at times looked like pink frosted cakes. And how pretty were her arms and neck, plump and gracefully designed. And there was a certain grace and abandon about her as she threw herself into her work as though she really enjoyed it. As she worked fast during the hottest portions of the day. There would gather on her upper lip and chin and forehead little beads of perspiration which she was always pausing in her work to touch with her handkerchief, while to him. Like jewels, they seemed only to enhance her charm. Wonderful days, these, now for Clyde. For once more and here. Where he could be near her the long day through. He had a girl whom he could study and admire and by degrees proceed to crave with all of the desire of which he seemed to be capable and with which he had craved Hortense Briggs, only with more satisfaction. Since as he saw it she was simpler, more kindly and respectable. And though for quite a while at first Roberto appeared or pretended to be quite indifferent to or unconscious of him. Still from the very first this was not true. She was only troubled as to the appropriate attitude for her. The beauty of his face and hands, the blackness and softness of his hair, the darkness and melancholy and lure of his eyes. He was attractive, oh, very beautiful, really, to her. And then one day shortly thereafter, Gilbert Griffiths walking through here and stopping to talk to Clyde, she was led to imagine by this that Clyde was really much more of a figure socially and financially than she had previously thought. For just as Gilbert was approaching, Lena Schlicht, who was working beside her, leaned over to say, here comes Mr. Gilbert Griffiths. His father owns this whole factory and when he dies, he'll get it, they say. And he's his cousin, she added, nodding toward Clyde. They look a lot alike, don't they? Yes, they do, replied Roberta, slyly studying not only Clyde but Gilbert, only I think Mr. Clyde Griffiths is a little nicer looking, don't you? Hoda Petconis, sitting on the other side of Roberto and overhearing this last remark, laughed. That's what everyone here thinks. He's not stuck up like that Mr. Gilbert Griffiths, either. Is he rich, too? inquired Roberta, thinking of Clyde. I don't know. They say not, she pursed her lips dubiously, herself rather interested in Clyde along with the others. He worked down in the shrinking room before he came up here. He was just working by the day, I guess. But he only came on here a little while ago to learn the business. Maybe he won't work in here much longer. Roberta was suddenly troubled by this last remark. She had not been thinking, or so she had been trying to tell herself, of Clyde in any romantic way. And yet the thought that he might suddenly go at any moment, never to be seen by her any more, disturbed her now. He was so youthful, so brisk so attractive. And so interested in her, too. Yes, that was plain. It was wrong to think that he would be interested in her, or to try to attract him by any least gesture of hers, since he was so important a person here, far above her. For, true to her complex, the moment she heard that Clyde was so highly connected and might even have money, 
she was not so sure that he could have any legitimate interest in her. For was she not a poor working girl, and was he not a very rich man's nephew? He would not marry her, of course. And what other legitimate thing would he want with her? She must be on her guard in regard to him. End of the chapter. Now. Chapter 15. The thoughts of Clyde at this time in regard to Roberto and his general situation in Lycurgus were for the most part confused and disturbing. For had not Gilbert warned him against associating with the help here? On the other hand, in so far as his actual daily life was concerned, his condition was socially the same as before. Apart from the fact that his move to Mrs. Payton's had taken him into a better street and neighborhood, he was really not so well off as he had been at Mrs. Cuppy's. For there at least he had been in touch with those young people who would have been diverting enough that he felt that it would have been wise to indulge them. But now, aside from a bachelor brother who was as old as Mrs. Payton herself, and a son thirty, slim and reserved, who was connected with one of the Lycurgus banks. He saw no one who could or would trouble to entertain him. Like the others with whom he came in contact, they thought him possessed of relationships which would make it unnecessary and even a bit presumptuous for them to suggest ways and means of entertaining him. On the other hand, while Roberta was not of that high world to which he now aspired, still there was that about her which enticed him beyond measure. Day after day and because so much alone, and furthermore because of so strong a chemical temperamental pull that was so definitely asserting itself, he could no longer keep his eyes off her, or she hers from him. There were evasive and yet strained and feverish eye flashes between them. And after one such in his case, a quick and furtive glance on her part at times, by no means intended to be seen by him, he found himself weak and then feverish. Her pretty mouth, her lovely big eyes, her radiant and yet so often shy and evasive smile. And, oh, she had such pretty arms, such a trim, lithe, sentient, quick figure and movements. If he only dared be friendly with her, venture to talk with and then see her somewhere afterwards, if she only would and if he only dared. Confusion. Aspiration. Hours of burning and yearning. For indeed he was not only puzzled but irritated by the anomalous and paradoxical contrasts which his life here presented. Loneliness and wistfulness as against the fact that it was being generally assumed by such as knew him that he was rather pleasantly and interestingly employed socially. Therefore in order to enjoy himself in some way befitting his present rank, and to keep out of the sight of those who were imagining that he was being so much more handsomely entertained than he was, he had been more recently. On Saturday afternoons and Sundays, making idle sightseeing trips to Glaversville, Fonda, Amsterdam and other places, as well as Grey and Crumb Lakes, where there were boats, beaches and bathhouses, with bathing suits for rent. And there, because he was always thinking that if by chance he should be taken up by the Griffiths, he would need as many social accomplishments as possible. And by reason of encountering a man who took a fancy to him and who could both swim and dive. He learned to do both exceedingly well. But canoeing fascinated him really. He was pleased by the picturesque and summery appearance he made in an outing shirt and canvas shoes battling about Crumb Lake in one of the bright red or green or blue canoes that were leased by the hour. And at such times these summer scenes appeared to possess an airy, fairy quality, especially with a summer cloud or two hanging high above in the blue. And so his mind indulged itself in daydreams as to how it would feel to be a member of one of the wealthy groups that frequented the more noted resorts of the North, Racket Lake, Scroon Lake, Lake George and Champlain, dance, golf, tennis, canoe with those who could afford to go to such places, the rich of Lycurgus. But it was about this time that Roberta with her friend Grace found Crumb Lake and had decided on it, with the approval of Mr. and Mrs. Newton, as one of the best and most reserved of all the smaller watering places about here. And so it was that they, too, were already given to riding out to the pavilion on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, and once there following the west shore along which ran a well-worn footpath which led to clumps of trees, underneath which they sat and looked at the water for neither could row a boat or swim. Also there were wild flowers and berry bushes to be plundered. And from certain marshy spots. 
to be reached by venturing out for a score of feet or more, it was possible to reach and take white lilies with their delicate yellow hearts. They were decidedly tempting and on two occasions already the marauders had brought Mrs. Newton large armfuls of blooms from the fields and shoreline here. On the third Sunday afternoon in July, Clyde, as lonely and rebellious as ever, was paddling about in a dark blue canoe along the south bank of the lake about a mile and a half from the boathouse. His coat and hat were off, and in a seeking and half-resentful mood he was imagining vain things in regard to the type of life he would really like to lead. At different points on the lake in canoes, or their more clumsy companions, the rowboats, were boys and girls, men and women and over the water occasionally would come their laughter or bits of their conversation. And in the distance would be other canoes and other dreamers, happily in love. As Clyde invariably decided, that being to him the sharpest contrast to his own lawn state. At any rate, the sight of any other youth thus romantically engaged with his girl was sufficient to set dissonantly jangling the repressed and protesting libido of his nature and this would cause his mind to paint another picture in which, had fortune favoured him in the first place by birth, he would now be in some canoe on Scroon or Aket or Champlain Lake with Sondra Finchley or some such girl, paddling and looking at the shores of a scene more distinguished than this. Or might he not be riding or playing tennis, or in the evening dancing or racing from place to place in some high-powered car. Sondra by his side? He felt so out of it, so lonely and restless and tortured by all that he saw here, for everywhere that he looked he seemed to see love, romance, contentment. What to do? Where to go? He could not go on alone like this forever. He was too miserable. In memory as well as mood his mind went back to the few gay happy days he had enjoyed in Kansas City before that dreadful accident, Ratterer, Hegland, Higby. Tina Kogel, Hortense, Ratterer's sister Louise, in short, the gay company of which he was just beginning to be a part when that terrible accident had occurred. And next to Dillard, Rita, Zella, a companionship that would have been better than this, certainly. Were the Griffiths never going to do any more for him than this? Had he only come here to be sneered at by his cousin, pushed aside, or rather completely ignored by all the bright company of which the children of his rich uncle were a part. And so plainly, from so many interesting incidents, even now in this dead summer time, he could see how privileged and relaxed and apparently decidedly happy were those of that circle. Notices in the local papers almost every day as to their coming and going here and there the large and expensive cars of Samuel as well as Gilbert Griffiths parked outside the main office entrance on such days as they were in Lycurgus. An occasional group of young society figures to be seen before the grill of the Lycurgus Hotel, or before one of the fine homes in Waikiki Avenue, someone having returned to the city for an hour or a night. And in the factory itself, whenever either was there, Gilbert or Samuel, in the smartest of summer clothes and attended by either Messrs. Smilly, Latch, Goboy or Berkey. All high officials of the company, making a most austere and even regal round of the immense plant and consulting with or listening to the reports of the various minor department heads. And yet here was he, a full cousin to this same Gilbert, a nephew to this distinguished Samuel, being left to drift and pine by himself, and for no other reason than. As he could now clearly see, he was not good enough. His father was not as able as this. His great uncle, his mother, might heaven keep her, not as distinguished or as experienced as his cold, superior, indifferent aunt. Might it not be best to leave? Had he not made a foolish move? After all, in coming on here? What, if anything, did these higher relatives ever intend to do for him? In loneliness and resentment and disappointment, his mind now wandered from the Griffiths and their world, and particularly that beautiful Sandra Finchley, whom he recalled with a keen and biting thrill, to Roberta and the world which she as well as he was occupying here. For although a poor factory girl, she was still so much more attractive than any of these other girls with whom he was every day in contact. How unfair and ridiculous for the Griffiths to insist that a man in his position should not associate with a girl such as Roberta, for instance, and just because she worked in the mill. 
He might not even make friends with her and bring her to some such lake as this or visit her in her little home on account of that. And yet he could not go with others more worthy of him, perhaps, for lack of means or contacts. And besides she was so attractive, very, and especially enticing to him. He could see her now as she worked with her swift, graceful movements at her machine. Her shapely arms and hands, her smooth skin and her bright eyes as she smiled up at him. And his thoughts were played over by exactly the same emotions that swept him so regularly at the factory. For poor or not. A working girl by misfortune only, he could see how he could be very happy with her if only he did not need to marry her. For now his ambitions toward marriage had been firmly magnetized by the world to which the Griffiths belonged. And yet his desires were most colorfully inflamed by her. If only he might venture to talk to her more, to walk home with her some day from the mill. To bring her out here to this lake on a Saturday or Sunday, and row about, just to idle and dream with her. He rounded a point studded with a clump of trees and bushes and covering a shallow where were scores of water lilies afloat, their large leaves resting flat upon the still water of the lake and on the bank to the left was a girl standing and looking at them. She had her hat off and one hand to her eyes for she was facing the sun and was looking down in the water. Her lips were parted in careless inquiry. She was very pretty, he thought, as he paused in his paddling to look at her. The sleeves of a pale blue waist came only to her elbows, and a darker blue skirt of flannel reconveyed to him the trimness of her figure. It wasn't Roberta. It couldn't be. Yes, it was. Almost before he had decided, he was quite beside her, some twenty feet from the shore, and was looking up at her. His face lit by the radiance of one who had suddenly, and beyond his belief, realized a dream. And as though he were a pleasant apparition suddenly evoked out of nothing and nowhere, a poetic effort taking form out of smoke or vibrant energy. She in turn stood staring down at him, her lips unable to resist the wavy line of beauty that a happy mood always brought to them. My, Miss Alden. It is you, isn't it? He called. I was wondering whether it was. I couldn't be sure from out there. Why, yes it is, she laughed, puzzled, and again just the least bit abashed by the reality of him. For in spite of her obvious pleasure at seeing him again. Only thinly repressed for the first moment or two, she was on the instant beginning to be troubled by her thoughts in regard to him, the difficulties that contact with him seemed to prognosticate. For this meant contact and friendship, maybe, and she was no longer in any mood to resist him, whatever people might think. And yet here was her friend, Grace Ma. Would she want her to know of Clyde and her interest in him? She was troubled. And yet she could not resist smiling and looking at him in a frank and welcoming way. She had been thinking of him so much and wishing for him in some happy, secure, commendable way. And now here he was, and there could be nothing more innocent than his presence here, nor hers. Just out for a walk, he forced himself to say, although, because of his delight and his fear of her really, he felt not a little embarrassed now that she was directly before him. At the same time he added, recalling that she had been looking so intently at the water. You want some of these water lilies? Is that what you're looking for? Uh, ha, huh, she replied, still smiling and looking directly at him. For the sight of his dark hair blown by the wind, the pale blue outing shirt he wore open at the neck, his sleeves rolled up and the yellow paddle held by him above the handsome blue boat, quite thrilled her. If only she could win such a youth for her very own self, just hers and no one else's in the whole world. It seemed as though this would be paradise. That if she could of him she would never want anything else in all the world. And here at her very feet he sat now in this bright canoe on this clear July afternoon in this summery world, so new and pleasing to her. And now he was laughing up at her so directly and admiringly. Her girlfriend was far in the rear somewhere looking for daisies. Could she? Should she? I was seeing if there was any way to get out to any of them, she continued a little nervously, a tremor almost revealing itself in her voice. I haven't seen any before just here on this side. I'll get you all you want, he exclaimed briskly and gaily. 
you just stay where you are. I'll bring them. But then, bethinking him of how much more lovely it would be if she were to get in with him, he added, but see here, why don't you get in here with me? There's plenty of room and I can take you anywhere you want to go. There's lots nicer lilies up the lake here a little way and on the other side too. I saw hundreds of them over there just beyond that island. Roberta looked. And as she did, another canoe paddled by, holding a youth of about Clyde's years and a girl no older than herself. She wore a white dress and a pink hat and the canoe was green. And far across the water at the point of the very island about which Clyde was talking was another canoe, bright yellow with a boy and a girl in that. She was thinking she would like to get in without her companion, if possible, with her, if need be. She wanted so much to have him all to herself. If she had only come out here alone. For if Grace Ma were included, she would know and later talk, maybe, or think. If she heard anything else in regard to them ever. And yet if she did not, there was the fear that he might not like her any more, might even come to dislike her or give up being interested in her, and that would be dreadful. She stood staring and thinking, and Clyde, troubled and pained by her doubt on this occasion and his own loneliness and desire for her, suddenly called. Oh, please don't say no. Just get in, won't you? You'll like it. I want you to. Then we can find all the lilies you want. I can let you out anywhere you want to get out, in ten minutes if you want to. She marked the I want you to, it soothed and strengthened her. He had no desire to take any advantage of her as she could see. But I have my friend with me here, she exclaimed almost sadly and dubiously, for she still wanted to go alone, never in her life had she wanted anyone less than Grace Marr at this moment. Why had she brought her? She wasn't so very pretty and Clyde might not like her and that might spoil the occasion. Besides, she added almost in the same breath and with many thoughts fighting her, maybe I'd better not. Is it safe? Oh, yes, maybe you better had, laughed Clyde seeing that she was yielding. It's perfectly safe, he added eagerly. Then maneuvering the canoe next to the bank, which was a foot above the water, and laying hold of a root to hold it still, he said. Of course you won't be in any danger. Call your friend then, if you want to, and I'll row the two of you. There's room for two and there are lots of water lilies everywhere over there. He nodded toward the east side of the lake. Roberta could no longer resist and seized an overhanging branch by which to steady herself. At the same time she began to call. Oh, Grey Ace! Grey Ace! Where are you? For she had at last decided that it was best to include her. A far-off voice as quickly answered, Hello oh. What do you want? Come up here. Come on. I got something I want to tell you. Oh, no, you come on down here. The daisies are just wonderful. No, you come on up here. There's someone here that wants to take us boating. She intended to call this loudly, but somehow her voice failed and her friend went on gathering flowers. Roberta frowned. She did not know just what to do. Oh, very well, then, she suddenly decided, and straightening up added, we can row down to where she is, I guess. And Clyde, delighted, exclaimed, oh, that's just fine. Sure. To get in. We'll pick these here first and then if she hasn't come, I'll paddle down nearer to where she is. Just step square in the center and that will balance it. He was leaning back and looking up at her and Roberta was looking nervously and yet warmly into his eyes. Actually it was as though she were suddenly diffused with joy, enveloped in a rosy mist. She balanced one foot. Will it be perfectly safe? Sure, sure, emphasized Clyde. I'll hold it safe. Just take hold of that branch there and steady yourself by that. He held the boat very still as she stepped. Then, as the canoe careened slightly to one side, she dropped to the cushion seat with a little cry. It was like that of a baby to Clyde. It's all right, he reassured her. Just sit in the center there. It won't tip over. Gee, but this is funny. I can't make it out quite. You know just as I was coming around that point I was thinking of you. 
how maybe you might like to come out to a place like this sometime. And now here you are and here I am, and it all happened just like that. He waved his hand and snapped his fingers. And Roberta, fascinated by this confession and yet a little frightened by it, added, is that so? She was thinking of her own thoughts in regard to him. Yes, and what's more, added Clyde, I've been thinking of you all day, really. That's the truth. I was wishing I might see you somewhere this morning and bring you out here. Oh, now, Mr. Griffiths. You know you don't mean that, pleaded Roberta. Fearful lest this sudden contact should take too intimate and sentimental a turn too quickly. She scarcely liked that because she was afraid of him and herself, and now she looked at him, trying to appear a little cold or at least disinterested. But it was a very weak effort. That's the truth, though, just the same, insisted Clyde. Well, I think it is beautiful myself, admitted Roberta. I've been out here, too, several times now. My friend and I. Clyde was once more delighted. She was smiling now and full of wonder. Oh, have you? he exclaimed, and there was more talk as to why he liked to come out and how he had learned to swim here. And to think I turned in here and there you were on the bank, looking at those water lilies. Wasn't that queer? I almost fell out of the boat. I don't think I ever saw you look as pretty as you did just now standing there. Oh, now, Mr. Griffiths, again pleaded Roberta cautiously. You mustn't begin that way. I'll be afraid you're a dreadful flatterer. I'll have to think you are if you say anything like that so quickly. Clyde once more gazed at her weakly, and she smiled because she thought he was more handsome than ever. But what would he think, she added to herself. If she were to tell him that just before he came around that point she was thinking of him too. And wishing that he were there with her, and not Grace. And how they might sit and talk, and hold hands perhaps. He might even put his arms around her waist, and she might let him. That would be terrible, as some people here would see it, she knew. And it would never do for him to know that, never. That would be too intimate, too bold. But just the same it was so. Yet what would these people here in Lycurgus think of her and him now if they should see her, letting him paddle her about in this canoe? He a factory manager and she an employee in his department. The conclusion. The scandal, maybe, even. And yet Grace Ma was along, or soon would be. And she could explain to her, surely. He was out rowing and knew her, and why shouldn't he help her get some lilies if he wanted to? It was almost unavoidable, this present situation, wasn't it? Already Clyde had maneuvered the canoe around so that they were now among the water lilies. And as he talked, having laid his paddle aside, he had been reaching over and pulling them up, tossing them with their long, wet stems at her feet as she lay reclining in the seat. One hand over the side of the canoe in the water. As she had seen other girls holding theirs. And for the moment her thoughts were allayed and modified by the beauty of his head and arms and the tousled hair that now fell over his eyes. How handsome he was. End of the chapter. Thank you. Thank you.